can you take us back to early August 2016 with your initial contact and its sort of evolution to date and how it can reduce the blockchain size with cut through? So the phrase contact is kind of an interesting one. What happened in August 2016 is that somebody signed on to, um, to the Bitcoin Wizards IRC channel, which is kind of a low volume research channel occupied by academics and Bitcoin people. Um, and they dropped the document on IRC with some dot onion, like it was a Tor hidden service. Uh, it was a text file. They, uh, they signed on, said, hey, I, I invented this thing. Some friends of mine said that this channel would be interested. They connected from a clear text IP um, somewhere in California, and then they disappeared uh, about 10 seconds later. And it wasn't until the next morning that I woke up. This happened, it was in the middle of the night for me. Um, I woke up, I downloaded this um, with, with wget, and I opened it with vim. You never know what a .txt might be when it's just some random link on the internet. Um, and it turned out it really was a text file. It had nothing funny in it, uh, except for a lot of words written in broken English, which described the novel crypto system, uh, which was Mimblewimble. <laughs> Uh, and that, let's see, that's much funnier than a virus now that I think about it. Um, and so that was, that was the initial contact, it was just the document was dropped, it wasn't super well written. Um, uh, a couple of us downloaded it and we were like, is this, is this a thing, does it, uh, does it work? And um, so over the, the next few weeks uh, or, or months, I spent some time investigating this. Um, so it was based largely on confidential transactions, which is a technology Greg Maxwell had developed in 2015, uh, which I had done a lot of work on uh, as part of my work at Blockstream. And so I was able to understand how it was using confidential transactions. It used this, did kind of this novel thing where it was using the secret key that ordinarily is only used for privacy it was using that for authentication as well. And then it was using this um, homomorphic property of confidential transactions. What that means is that you can, um, all of the amounts in a transaction are encrypted, but you can still add up the inputs, you can add up the outputs and check that they're equal. Uh, and you're adding up encryptions, you just get an encrypted sum, you get another encrypted sum, and you just, I mean, if they're the same, then they're the same. Um, and that's one part of transaction validity. Right, the two pieces of transaction validity are first, did everybody sign off on it? Who needs to sign off? And then secondly, does the transaction balance, right? No money's being created or destroyed or whatever. Um, and Mimblewimble got rid of the first thing. It said, well, we're gonna use privacy, the, the privacy key for authentication. And then if it's possible to make this sum work that requires knowledge of the private, the, the um, hiding key, and uh, that knowledge is sufficient for authentication. So there's going to be no more validity conditions other than that these things add up. And, uh, and that really opened the door to all sorts of, of cool effects. You could combine transactions together. Um, and since the validity condition was just that they added up, of course, if you, you combine two things that add to zero, they'll still add to zero, uh, even across an entire blockchain's worth of things that add to zero. Um, and this seemed like a, a viable idea. Um, it took uh, several months to figure out how exactly you could hook this stuff into a blockchain, what needed to be committed to and where, what needed to be revealed and to who, uh, whether you could really delete intermediate data the way that Voldemort envisioned. And uh, it turned out that these all had, had pretty reasonable answers. So I, uh, I hacked together a, a somewhat more formal paper uh, in a panic over the six weeks between the paper being dropped uh, before scaling Bitcoin Milan. Uh, which is when I gave a talk, and that was more when Mimblewimble became uh, more well known. A couple of weeks after that, on Bitcoin Wizard again, somebody showed up. This time, rather than using the name Voldemort, who published the original paper, they were using the name Ignatius Peveril, which is a slightly more esoteric character from Harry Potter. Uh, Peveril, um, there, Igno Peveril, there were, there were three of them. Igno invented the invisibility cloak. Uh, which was, was passed down through Dumbledore to, to James and Sirius and then to Harry. Um, and what Igno said that he was doing was creating a, uh, an implementation of Mimblewimble called Grin, which is short for Gringotts, the wizarding bank. Um, and he set up a, a GitHub account, he set up a project, and he started developing it. And over the, the following months, this is I think at the end of 2016, beginning of 2017, um, several other people joined, also using various Harry Potter pseudonyms, and the project has continued to this day. So, um, 
The original Voldemort paper, or the original Voldemort, I have no contact with. It was really just a one-way draw. Um, but with IGNO and with the GRIN project, I have much more communication. And they're kind of off doing their own thing. I don't follow it too closely. I know a lot of people ask me about it, and I'm, I'm sorry that I don't know what's happening day to day. But they use a lot of the crypto that I've helped develop. Um, and I spend a lot of time talking to them and helping uh, uh, get that crypto to be, first of all, secure, but also as efficient as it can possibly be, because that's really what I focus on. So a follow-up question about Grin. Uh, so it's the first implementation of, 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 of Mimblewimble. Do you see more blockchains in the future using Mimblewimble, or? Well, it's curious to describe Grin as the first implementation. So Mimblewimble was dropped in, in August 2016. It's actually been possible to do Mimblewimble transactions on the Elements sidechain since 2015 when confidential transactions was first released. Because the way that Mimblewimble works is it starts with confidential transactions and it just drops a whole bunch of uh, extra stuff that Voldemort felt was extraneous and gets its scalability and privacy benefits that way. But in fact, you can go, uh, I'm not sure if, if the alpha sidechain, which is our, our demo, was still running, but if it is, you can go uh, use that and create transactions that have no scripts, uh, and those will be valid Mimblewimble transactions. Um, it's, not, it's not super elegant, it's not super clean, and there isn't really tooling for it. Um, but that's one example of a non-grin chain that is doing Mimblewimble. Um, and then, as a second thing, there's a rumor I heard that Monero is doing some sort of Mimblewimble sidechain. I can never tell if Rick is just trolling or not, but he, uh, he announced that he was doing this, um, and that potentially could be yet another blockchain. Um, and I've heard interest from a number of people all kind of doing their own thing. Um, the, uh, the main takeaway is that Mimblewimble is really, it's, it's a general technology for producing transactions and validating them. Uh, Grin is a specific implementation of it, Elements is a specific implementation of it, uh, whatever is in Rick's head is a, is a specific uh, uh, envisionment of it. Um, and so these, these are all instantiations of uh, general technology. So this next question is aimed for Corey. Uh, in an interview, you said that, quote, Satoshi left us with a monolithic blob of a code base. Could you tell us more about your work with Bitcoin Core, what you have learned from splitting up the code into more efficient chunks, and what work you have specifically done to make blockchain uh, more scalable? Sure. So that gets into a, a really different element of scalability, one that I think is um, is actually considerably more important at the moment, but is uh, is is not really discussed because it's not. It, it, there, there, there hasn't been an event to point it out yet. The the um, development model of of writing blockchain software, I think, hasn't hasn't really scaled or kept up at all with the uh, with, with the, the the new demands put on it. Um, so one of the things that I, that I work on on Bitcoin Core is, is kind of breaking things up in, into smaller pieces that can hopefully be reused in other, uh, in, in other tools or, um, or for, for better testing of, of Bitcoin Core itself. Uh, when, when Satoshi wrote Bitcoin uh, in, in, in the beginning, it was, it was like three or, or four CPP files, maybe it was, maybe it was 10, um, but, but they, were, they were enormous, Every, everything was, was everywhere. Uh, so as, as, as far as just good coding practice goes, it was it was abysmal. Um, there's there's wallet code and mixed in with peer-to-peer -peer stuff. There's 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 there was just kind of no way to um, uh, take chunks of it and kind of prove them to be sane. So one of the things that I work on on the most is trying to try, trying to modularize the code base. Um, but e even even doing so, even even. Uh, in doing the modularization, it's still making changes to scary parts of the code that has the potential to, uh, you know, cause an accidental chain split or something. So that's, uh, it's it's something that's like, like I said, it's really not discussed enough, in my opinion, is is how to properly do development and be uh, be sure, or, or at least relatively sure that your your new version, your new code. Um, whether it's correct or not, at least is the same has the same properties as as the old code. So I, I think that, that tooling has a really really long way to go for uh, for, for blockchain scalability. So this next question is for John. In 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 in, in an interview you, you did for op, or episode five of Off Chain with Jimmy Song, I would highly recommend it to anybody in the audience. Uh, you talked about your month-long residency at Chain Code Labs. Could you elaborate more on that? Yeah, so I, I got interested in Bitcoin in 2015. 
Um, I was working in telecoms network software in Australia at the time, and uh, I heard a podcast about Bitcoin. I looked at it again, and I was uh, bitten and grabbed and became completely obsessed with Bitcoin, as many people do. And after a short while, the question wasn't if I was going to quit my job and work on Bitcoin, it was when. And that happened about a year later. I, I quit my job. My plan was to move back to England and, and work on Bitcoin. Um, but at just that time, Chaincode and Matt Corallo organized a month-long residency program in New York. Um, they, it was Matt's idea. He wanted to bring people into Bitcoin development who were developers but hadn't necessarily worked on Bitcoin before. So I applied for that. Um, they accepted me. And at the end of that month-long program, um, I was hired by Chaincode to work full-time on Bitcoin. So that, that was a great experience for me. And then um, about a year after I started at Chaincode, I decided I, I wanted to repeat that. Um, so I organized the second iteration of that residency, which we completed in, in February this year. We had 11 developers come in, um, working on Bitcoin over the period of a month, um, just helping them understand or, or continue to understand Bitcoin and understand the code base and allow them to contribute in some way to Bitcoin development. Um, and I was, I was really thrilled with the outcome. We had a lot of really great developers come in, very talented people, and, and hopefully we'll see some great contributions from them. Could you talk more about the education part that Chaincode provides? How does it uh, create and educate developers that will be able to address uh, issues such as scalability in the future? Yeah, I think the developer community, scaling the developer community is, is another issue that, that we need to tackle um, in Bitcoin. There, there aren't that many developers who understand Bitcoin and who understand the Bitcoin core code base. Um, I, I have enormous freedom at Chaincode to work on what I think is important, and for me, that's really important. So that's why I wanted to run the residency, and I, I had the support I needed to do that. Um, I've also done things with Jimmy Song for programming blockchain and um, scaling Bitcoin. There's a workshop that I helped, helped with for that. Um, I find it really important. It's, it's just personally for me, that's something I want to work on. Um, I, I want more people working on Bitcoin. I want more people to understand the technology of Bitcoin. Um, so that's, that's where I spend my time. So now a question for all three panelists. At the Scaling Bitcoin workshop at Stanford last year, Andrew, to the left of me, did a presentation called Using Chains for What Chains Are Good For. Once again, anybody in the audience that has not listened to that, I would highly recommend it. So my question is, what are chains good for? And do you think in the future will we stop looking at blockchains as a linear structure and perhaps something more as a directed acyclic graph, for example? We could go in the other direction, yeah, so I'm not monopolizing let's start off with all the answers. Okay. Um, what are blockchains good for? Uh, they're, they're really slow and inefficient. Um, they take a long time to confirm things. Um, but they're really good at arriving at some agreed state. That's, that's really what they are for. Um, in Bitcoin, we have a set of unspent transaction outputs. We call that the UTXO set. That's all of the unspent Bitcoin. And all the blockchain does is allow lots of participants to arrive at the same result for what that UTXO set is. That's it. Um, it the blockchain doesn't magically make things true that weren't true. Putting something on the blockchain doesn't make it true. Um, the, the participants in the network, the full nodes, do all of the verification themselves and they arrive at the same answer. Um, so what is the blockchain good for and what should we put on the blockchain? I think it's transactions that can be verified. All of the complexity, all of the smart contracting and the, the private transacting between individuals can happen off blockchain and then the blockchain is used as a, an anchor of trust or a final arbiter in the case of disputes. I, I agree with all that to add uh, a, a little bit to uh, kind of defining the, the primitives. I, I think that block, block, blockchains are useful for, um, for, for, for time stamping and then to, to, to tack on to that kind of moving a token and, and proving that it has, hasn't been moved already. So I, ideally, that's it. I, ideally, it's, it's uh, not clear what the token is, what it represents. Um, so I, I, I think that 
what blockchains are good for, uh, the, it's, it, it tends to be pretty overblown because the, the current hype is to, is to put everything on, on a chain. Uh, in, in reality, that doesn't make a ton of sense. You can, you can put a bunch of commitments on chain and then prove what they are later. That's, that's uh, the, the direction that I think that people should be looking. Um, yeah, uh, basically to reiterate what John and Corey said, blockchains give you time stamping. Um, they give you a transaction ordering is really the essential thing. And they give that in a way that uh, is possible to achieve a global consensus on um, without needing to worry about um, network connectivity. Uh, well, I mean, you do eventually, but you don't need to have such a synchronous network that everybody actually has a single unified clock. Um, and this is good because physically there are no uh, global clocks. Uh, that's, that's special relativity. Um, and what blockchains give you is this way to achieve a global clock very slowly, unfortunately. Um, and if we were working with more than just Earth, if we had other planets, it would need to be even slower because ultimately we are just trying to get around this uh, uh, limits on how possible it is to make things simultaneous uh, by running them very slowly, by doing things on time scales such that the... Uh, well, not only the, the physical limits, like I, I, I like to think about this this way because it's easier, it's a bit more, more cleaner, but uh, the speed of light is not really the limit when you're communicating over computer networks. What you care about is the speed of information propagation, and that's much, much slower. And not only is it slower because you've got various routers, various hops, different paths, different congestion, blah, 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 uh, it's also possible to adversarially control and that's really where Bitcoin shines, is that it's possible to achieve a global consensus even when people are actively trying to prevent that from happening, which is what you need for, say, a monetary system when there are naturally financial incentives for people to cause disagreements in the state of the system. Um, but really it's just a very simple thing. It's just an ordering. It's just this one little piece that's, uh, that the blockchain provides. And as John said, Putting something on a blockchain doesn't make it true, it just makes it provably having occurred after things that happened earlier in the blockchain. And all of the additional verification happens kind of uh, outside of the blockchain um, and, and can hopefully be done with some much more efficient construction. I'm going to start off with Corey for this question. Uh, with all of your work in Bitcoin Core, what are you most optimistic and most pessimistic about? in the year 2018? Uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that it, it seems like we have, uh, um, in, in general, the, the, the floodgates seem to have reopened for, for research, for experimentation. Um, there was a, a, a lot of gridlock for a, for a long time that caused, I, we, we saw some developer exits, we saw lots, lots of, of frustration and downtime. Um, it, it, it seems like there's been a, a kind of shift in opinions lately, or, or maybe it's, it's a reinvigoration of, of some uh, older development efforts, but it's, it's, it seems like the, the Bitcoin days of, of 2013 or 2014, again, it, it's, it, seems, it seems interesting and fun, so I'm, I'm really excited to see where some, uh, s some of these new ideas end up going. Um, Pessimistically, like, like I said, it, it's it's a, a, a constant fear of mine that one of my one of my code changes in Bitcoin Core will destroy all of Bitcoin. So <laughs> that's fair. I, th I think that's about as pessimistic as it gets. Not uh, sure. Yeah. Um, same as Corey. I, I'm I'm really optimistic. Um, I'm generally optimistic about Bitcoin. I think there's lots of really really cool technology coming along. Um, I was excited about Mast, but more excited now about Taproot and Graftroot. I'm excited about Lightning, uh, excited about Schnorr signatures, batch validation, signature aggregation. Um, there's lots of really, really cool technology coming along and the smartest people in the world working on it. So there's, there's reason to be optimistic. Um, pessimism. Uh, I, I hope that mining does not continue to centralize. I, th I think that's a problem. Uh, it's a question that we don't have an answer to right now, and we just have to play the game and see what happens. Um, hopefully, hopefully we won't end up with one miner controlling more than 51% of the hash rate for a long time, but who knows. Um, 
I'll start with, uh, with pessimism so that uh, we can end this question on a happy note. Um, so what I'm pessimistic about is that uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies more widely represent a major paradigm shift in the way that we think about um, trust, in the way that we think about money, in the way that we think about communication and, uh, and economic interaction. And this paradigm shift has been embraced by a lot of us early adopters who, uh, who see this vision and are very excited by it but it's very different from the way that people ordinarily interact with the world, and it's been very difficult to communicate. Um, and I think we're getting better as the years go by. Uh, there, there have been some fantastic talks, even uh, like at this conference this morning, trying to communicate uh, the subtleties of, of the kind of problems that we want to deal with. And at this point in 2018, Bitcoin is very visible to the wider world, to the political world, and, and to ordinary people who maybe are not familiar with these kind of, of deep philosophical changes that we're trying to bring about. And I worry that uh, um, regulatory bodies and that other uh, institutionalized powers are going to attempt to react to this new changing landscape before they've had time to fully digest it, before they've had time to understand it, because our ability to communicate these things is maybe not as good as it could possibly be. Um, and if we find that there are entrenched rules and, and laws and regulations, trying to treat Bitcoin as though it were part of an old paradigm that could potentially cause uh, limitations to its usability. Uh, and usefulness for people around the world. Um, optimistically, in 2018, um, I'm very optimistic about the state of cryptography as it uh, applies to scalability and privacy. Um, as Paul mentioned, I gave a talk using chains for what chains are good for several months ago. At the time that I did that talk, I had like a couple little vague ideas uh, about how you could move um, certain kinds of transactions, specifically like um, hash pre-images that are used in Lightning, move those off of the chain into some sort of multi-signature construction. Um, and since then, uh, there has been a lot of development uh, along those lines. Uh, Taj here has something called discrete log contracts. Uh, we've developed, uh, um, or we, we've uh, discovered and started implementing something called aggregate signatures, where you can combine multiple signatures into a single key uh, and do this in a way that's provably secure even against different key holders trying to attack each other, um, which was a difficult question. Um, we have new ways to do the, these hash pre-images, of course, uh, and then we have Taproot, which I mentioned earlier, and a variant called Graftroot, uh, which gives you a way to dynamically change what the spending conditions of an output are as long as all parties agree to, to make that change. Um, and the result is basically all of the widely deployed smart contracts on Bitcoin today uh, and all of the soon to be widely deployed contracts can achieve all of their functionality in a, uh, in, uh, using Bitcoin outputs that look the same as ordinary single owner Bitcoins. And so this vision of moving all of the detailed like inter-party uh, uh, contractual things off of, the, off of the chain and having the chain only verify the ordering and, and verify some digital signatures to check that you know, somebody with an interest in these coins agreed that they should move the way that they did. Um, that suddenly seemed a lot more feasible uh, with this new technology that we've developed. Um, and this is, this is really, really fast moving. Uh, I had hoped to give a talk about it here and then I just like, I didn't even have a good stopping point to stop and, and describe these things. Uh, so, so instead I joined this panel. Um, so, so 2018 to me is, is really an exciting year. I think it's, it's probably the most exciting year in terms of applied cryptography for blockchains. Um, and there's going to be some really cool stuff coming out of there. Well, we're coming up on 12.45. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists one more question, but if you have any questions for them, I would start lining up now. Uh, but just as the audience starts to line up, any final comments that you want to discuss about blockchain scalability? Starting with, uh, we'll start with John. Um, I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit still. Um, we have all of these exciting new technologies, but currently deployed on the network, we have the opportunity to use known techniques and, and known technologies to increase, increase the throughput of, of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin network. Um, we can batch transactions, we can use SegWit, we can do lots and lots of things which will increase the utility of Bitcoin 
um, allow new use cases, allow more users without any of this new novel crypto. Um, so one of the places where I think we should be focusing is um, trying to encourage Bitcoin industry players to adopt these scalable or, or more scalable technologies today. Uh, I, I agree completely. It's been it's been interesting to see the the slow uptake of, of some of the uh, so Segwit, for example. Um, it, it, it's been interesting to see how long it's taken for for some big companies to deploy some of this stuff when arguably it would have saved a substantial amount of money, um, which kind of would 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 lead you to believe that the the scalability or or at least the the transaction throughput is is not. Uh, it, not not quite the issue that it's it's perceived to be by some. I think uh, it, it would it would be nice to see some of this stuff uh, implemented a little bit more quickly. Um, so I, I've been talking about cryptographic uh, improvements of scalability for some number of years, and when I first started doing this, there was kind of a feeling that, that I even partially shared that maybe this kind of stuff wasn't that useful because it was going to only give us like some small factor speed up. You know, like, like maybe you could double the throughput of the system by having aggregate signatures, which are only half as large as ordinary signatures. But yeah, that's great. Now you have, you know, twice as large a system. How are you going to onboard a million times as many people? Um, and over the years, I've become much more optimistic about these kind of techniques. Um, so, for example, uh, in the last couple of years, um, I guess uh, Corey and, and John and others developed compact blocks uh, and implemented and deployed this, and now suddenly bandwidth uh, is much less of a concern than it used to be. And so saving, maybe saving 50% of your space and signatures doesn't matter, but there's another benefit for aggregate signatures, which is how fast you can validate these and you can validate these, uh, batch validate them potentially five or ten times as fast as ordinary signatures. And now that bandwidth is not so much of a concern, that validation cost uh, really has a chance to shine. Um, and this is all kind of much more impressive than I had envisioned a few years ago, back when I was thinking like, oh, what, what, what's a factor of two? Um, and it's not clear to me what the limit is here. And I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to continue to explore this and continue to find new things.